Hi, I'm Thomas Demore, lead architect at Quantum Active Scale Object Storage. And um, let us kick off with an object storage overview and an introduction to Active Scale. So I think Ed briefly mentioned um, a couple of use cases that really produce this unstructured data. Media and entertainment is an obvious one. We have video data. Um, that's the same case in surveillance, in um, the ADAS space, where we have these autonomous vehicles that, that generate a lot of video data and other sensor data. Um, and of course, this data needs to be analyzed. So the big data analytics space um, is also a prime candidate here. Genome, HPC, the list goes on. Um, and all these different use cases all have a fairly similar um, demands for the system storing this, this unstructured data. And the great thing is that this, the system is really one system to serve them all. They, they can serve all types of use cases and they can serve different applications at the same time. So an object storage system um, can, can, it can be multiple clients. It's a multi-use case um, application. So for, and all these use cases can have different access patterns. So you can see basically there are three sets of arrows or interactions here. And so on the left, you see the data producers. And so they can, on the, at the top, you can see they, they can interact directly with, the, with the, the storage system. So these are typically S3 native applications which do direct IO against the system. Um, some of them, and that's the second uh, group, they store, store stuff in the system to have like a golden copy of the data, but then need faster access um, to, read, to read stuff back, or they want to post-process it. So then the data gets copied over again into a, um, a gateway system or a post-processing system uh, where, where further operations uh, can happen. I think Sherman is going to demo um, a nice use case of this uh, later in the session. And then I think also Ed, Ed mentioned this before, then we have basically systems in front of the object storage system, for instance, like the Stonex file system, which can use the object storage system as a tier behind them. And so you can have one system which can be performing all these different use cases at the same time, at the same point in time. So multiple applications all talking to it um, at the same point in time. And so let's, let's take um, one example, like the, the hospital, um, scan in the medical imaging space. So that's, um, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, one of my um, best friends had to have this, have had, had a scan. He had a, a tumor in his, in his brain. Fortunately, it was a, a malignant, a not a malignant one. Um, but so you get the scan, you get, um, you put you in the scanner, uh, the images come out. And so the doctor or the Radiologists, they look at they look at the data, and they want to look at the data today. They want to look at the data um, next week when you had the operation, and they want to look at at the data as they track you over time in the coming years to um, potentially look for um, for relapses. And the same hold, I mean, the same holds for that data is then ingested into um, is in the research systems. And so the same thing holds there. They want to be able to keep on processing and that data. And so the data needs to be available over a long period of time. And so of course, this also means you need to reliably store it for that period of time to be able to access it. And of course, because of the nature of the data, this is, this is sensitive data. So security and, and compliance, uh, I didn't find an ability for compliance. So um, ability to comply, and of course, as this is a very broad use case, um, you want, if you can leverage multiple hospitals or facilities and um, leveraging the same system, um, you, can, you can get efficiencies of, of scale and efficiencies of managing the system. So there's only one single system that needs to be managed. And of course, you need to store this data in the most cost-efficient manner. So because the, the more cost-efficient you, you can store your data, the more relative value your data has. And so the more, the more value you can extract from that data. And so basically these unstructured data use cases, they touch all the illities as we call it, that, that, you, that you see on the left and that we just um, discussed. 
And object storage systems are um, uniquely positioned to serve um, that use case and to serve the, the structured data market um, while maintaining all these abilities. And I think the, the, the prime um, the prime driver here is the volume of the data. The data is so big, it cannot fit on one disk, one node, one rack. Um, so it, the system has to scale. It doesn't mean that it cannot start small. Um, it, can, it can start small, but it has to have the ability to scale over time and to dramatically scale to, um, as, I, as I said before, um, dozens of, of petabytes. And so that scale, the scalability required from the system makes that maintaining the other illities becomes challenging, becomes, a, becomes technically challenging. So um, legacy systems which were in place cannot both um, reach the scale and have availability, durability, and all the other illities in place. And object storage systems are um, in a prime position to do that. And so why are they so special? What are the, the properties of object storage systems? So, so the data is immutable. There's no random writing inside an object. An object, it's not there, and then you upload it as a whole, and then it's there, and you cannot change it anymore. And also object stores have a flat namespace, um, and we'll discuss in the metadata section um, why this is important, but this enables performance at scale. And so what does it mean, a flat namespace? You see three objects there, and they're all in the bucket tech field day 22. And then there's a, there's a schedule Excel file and then two MP4s, which um, they share the prefix recordings. So there's no directory recordings. It's a flat namespace. So there's no directories. And there's no hierarchical namespace with directories and inodes as you have in a file. It's basically, just, these are just a list of objects. And some of them happen to share some um, some part of the, if they are key, their name, and in the beginning of the name, the prefix. And so the, the S3 API allows you to, to leverage that to manage your system. So you can, for instance, say in the bucket uh, tech field A22, I want um, fitting which, which starts with recordings. I want to have um, a worm guarantee of two years. I don't want to um, delete, ha have the ability to, lead, to delete these videos, these MP4s, in the next two years because. We're only recording it today. Um, let's hope that, that this, this data is relevant for two years. The, the exact schedule of today might even think that today from now, it's okay to delete that. So by not having directories as a hierarchical structure, but in, in, instead prefixes, um, you basically re replace that as a, uh, a way of organizing data, but without um, the constraints of having um, hierarchical directory um, entry layout and to it an inode layout. But we'll, we'll go into more detail why that's important. And um, thirdly, an object has, a, has custom metadata and that's I think up to two, two kilobytes per object of key value pairs that, that can be uploaded together with the object data and so the customer can choose that. Um, and so this really enhances classification possibility. Um, you can you can be searchable, you can, um, as Sherman will show, and, um, have post processing and outside systems um, acting on these uh, key value pairs to make um, rich applications. So the S3 API is the de facto standard um, of, of object storage. There, I think that originated in 2006, yeah, Amazon um, object storage as is, it's a bit older, I think around early 2000s. Um, Belgian company, I'm, I'm from Belgium, we're active scale uh, core engineering is based in Belgium. So another Belgian company, Filepool, um, got, got um, started in the late 1990s. Um, they basically pioneered um, content addressable storage where you would, um, give an object to the system and you would get a hash back. And if you give the hash back to the system, you would get your data back. So that was basically the first version of object stores, early 2000s. And then um, Amazon uh, came on board 2006 um, and a number of other companies were started. And so ActiveScale, so, uh, which was an Ampli data product was started in 2008. 
around this space. Um, and then in the coming years, there was quickly a consolidation um, towards the S3 API as the de facto standard. And so why is it such a great API? Because it's, it's a, the volume of data, again, is so big that you need a different way of managing. There's no admin who can set up the LUNs or the volumes or who can configure filers. So there's too much data. The system is too large um, to make that um, attractable. And so the great thing about the S3 API, that's, that's a self-service API. So the end user can manage their buckets and objects themselves. And so that scales out with the number of users of the system and not with the number of admins. And the other great thing is that um, compared to the types of storage systems that came before it, object storage um, has features which are integrated and they are not built in front of it or bolted on top. And so there's no um, ILM software to do lifecycle management externally. There's no um, key management server somewhere. There's no Kerberos authentication externally. Um, those things are all built into the system, um, as are some other rich um, bucket and object level metadata features. I, I mentioned um, Worm before, like the ability to not delete, to not be able to delete the data. That's the S3 log feature. Um, and for instance, versioning, which is probably my, my favorite S3 feature because so many other ones depend on it, um, which is basically an object level snapshot. And so it's, it's a way to also have the concept of snapshots and not versioning your data um, in, an S3, um, in an S3 object store in a different way than, than you can do it in traditional uh, file systems. And so I was talking about 2006, 2008. I think by now everybody is S3 compatible, right? I mean, at least everybody um, claims they are. Um, so there's been a lot of evolution and you see that the, the S3 and the, the file system NAS space, they are, they are getting closer together. But there's a, there's a big difference between um, an object store and the S3 API. So the S3 API is an API to an object storage system. And it's not because um, you in in implement the S3 API that you're an object storage system. So some systems um, built S3 on top of file. So they, they still have internally that hierarchical structure of, of directories. Um, and so that, that creates these problems of not, how many files can I put in a directory um, how many parallel uploads can I do in the same directory? Um, how, if I delete, if I delete an object, does it leave or leave behind empty directories? All these kind of artifacts of, of not having a, a true object storage flat namespace are, can be present there. Um, sometimes S3 compatibility is limited to put, get, and delete, which is yeah, reading data, writing data, getting rid of it. We're 2020, so the S3 AP, the S3 API is, is um, way more rich. I think that on the previous slide, we, we highlighted a lot of these great bucket level and object level features, which, which come on top of that. So definitely some of these systems are very fast. Of course, they're, they're NAS, they're file systems. They are, they're built to be fast, but that doesn't mean that because they're fast and they implement the S3 API that they're better object stores. Um, so the things to consider here are how far do these systems scale? Can, what happens if I add a rack? Can I add a rack? Um, and how well protected is my data? What happens if, to be very fast, storing or touching a lot of devices is a um, is typically a, a performance or a, a speed a latency um, problem? Whereas for object storage and for for durability and resiliency, you want to um, have uh, a lot of uh, devices cooperating in, in storing your data because that's, that ensures that your data is durably stored and that it will remain available in the future. Um, but we'll go into a lot more detail in, in how this works. 